Hello and welcome. Thank you so much all for taking the time to join us today. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network. It's my pleasure once more to welcome you to today's webinar. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you can't see them or have any other technical difficulties today, you can send us a tech support request via email at milfamln at gmail.com. We'll place this email address in the chat pod momentarily for your convenience and reference. As some of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversation, questions, and hellos, as many of you have done already. Thank you so much. To embed the chat pod so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then hopefully see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen, and then from there you can select the chat bubble icon. When typing any comments or questions, please be sure to send those to everyone, that response option. You can adjust that uh, right above where it says type message here. There should be a drop down menu if it is not currently selected. This just ensures everyone who's on today's webinar can view those as they come through the chat pod. We'll also be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. And another brief note that you can find and download the event materials, including today's slides on our event page. Closed captioning is available for today's webinar. Note that it is uh, an auto-generated, so if you would prefer an accurate transcription, please just email us to request one following today's webinar. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD-USDA partnership for military families, and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. It's my pleasure now to turn things over to my colleague, Kaylin Goebel. She's the program coordinator with the MFLN Family Development Team. She's today's moderator and she'll be introducing our presenters today. Kaylin. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I see we have a vast um, array of attendees today joining us from all over. So we're glad you could join us for today's live session. Or if you're watching today's recorded session, we are glad that you found us. Um, this presentation has also been a collaboration with the National Center on the Sexual Behavior of Youth team. So we also would like to thank Dr. Jane Solovsky and her team over at NCSBY for their work um, on this webinar and making today's session possible. Today's session is also based upon work supported by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, Office of Justice Programs, and the U.S. Department of Justice. So we thank our colleagues as well at the DOD, OJJDP, OJP, and DOJ for their work and collaboration on this presentation and our greater SVCY series. For today's session, we are joined by Sherry Ely and Honorable Judge John Romero. Sherry Ely is a licensed social worker and currently serves as a program director for juvenile justice with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges in Reno, Nevada. And Honorable Judge John Romero is a former presiding judge of the Children's Court Division of the Second Judicial District Court in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he currently serves as chair of the NCJFCJ Military Committee. So before I turn officially things over to them to begin the presentation, I do want to note that all of the resources that our presenters will be noting um, some really great resources throughout the presentation, those will be available as well on the event page under event materials um, as a one stop shop so you can get those um, easily accessible as well as Jason Jowers, my colleague, will continue to pop some resources in the chat pod today. Um, and again, as Coral said, please make sure you have that everyone um, drop down selected so we can all see um, your activity in the chat pod. And I will also be covering continuing education credit information. So stay tuned until the end of today's session um, and the conclusion of our presentation. And I will be going over that. So thank you all again. And I am um, pleased to be turning things over to our presenters to begin today's session. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today to talk with you uh, and present information about juvenile justice responses to youth in conflict with the law. So a lot of folks uh, find juvenile court a mystery to, to the extent that they even think about juvenile court existing. Uh, it is different from adult criminal court. Uh, 
So generally speaking, the purpose of juvenile court is to serve youth under the age of majority. Those under 18 generally, although some states still have under 17, so 16 year olds uh, per, or, and 17 year olds might be in the adult criminal system. That's changing and there are fewer of those states uh, who uh, don't treat minor, major, minority as being under the age of 18. Uh, delinquency or delinquent act is uh, what otherwise would be a criminal act if you were an adult. And this type of case is processed through the juvenile justice system in state courts. Uh, understand uh, quite simply that youth are not the same as adults, both in terms of uh, their level of responsibility or culpability, if you want to use that term. And uh, Research and youth development tells us that there's greater potential for uh, rehabilitation for younger folks than there is for older folks. Juvenile court has some specific goals. Uh, certainly the juvenile court system, the juvenile justice system is concerned with maintaining public safety. Uh, and that includes safety for the youth, of course, not just everyone else but the youth. The goals of the juvenile court are also to help develop uh, skills in youth, not to turn them off or put them in a place where their development is, is stifled or delayed because of, of things that we do to them when we think we're doing something for them. Rehabilitation is a clear goal of juvenile court and some in the adult system may say that uh, in the adult system, uh, it's all about punishment. Sadly, in juvenile court, at least history indicates that uh, punishment has been one of the uh, unfortunate consequences of not doing juvenile justice correctly. Juvenile court uh, assesses and, and determines what treatment needs youth may have uh, as part of the whole uh, objective of juvenile court. So treatment needs are assessed and addressed where appropriate. <clears throat> For those youth who are confined, committed to either short-term or long-term um, because of, of deeds that they are alleged to have committed and adjudicated for, uh, the juvenile court certainly is concerned about steps to reintegrate the youth back into the community along with the families that they've been separated from. This video, short video is gonna talk about the brain, brain science of adolescence. And uh, uh, I'll have a, a, a quick question for you after the, after the video shows, but pay very close attention to uh, what is presented in the video and we'll talk about it once that's over with. As we all age, our bodies change, stretch, grow, and so do our brains. Some scientists say that kids' brains are still developing up until they're 25. As you get older, gray matter starts to cover your brain. Just before puberty, you get a massive amount of it. And as adolescence sets in and goes on, your brain starts to actually prune that gray matter back. And a process called myelination happens, coating the nerve cells. These developments basically mean that neurons start talking to each other much more effectively in the brain. It makes sense that teenagers use the brain differently too. Take the amygdala, the tiny almond-shaped area in the brain. It's where emotions get processed, but not necessarily that well. For example, if you're angry at someone, your frontal lobe could tell you to insult them, but your amygdala might tell you to punch them in the face instead. If I'm a child or a teenager, I'm not thinking about like the long-term consequences of my actions. I'm not thinking about what's gonna happen to this person tomorrow or the next day. It's very easy to kind of get swept up in peer pressure, this confluence of, of, of events that really forces a kid into a bad situation. The same person who committed an offense at 17 is not the same person 10, 15 years later. So Kai, we've talked about the consequences of labeling a minor a criminal, but now I kind of want to focus on why we understand that that label is inappropriate. So this fascinating thing, this conversation happens in episode five about brain science and all of this research about how the adult brain is very different from the teenage brain. So I want you to explain this. This is the brightest spot, I think, in the world of reform, um, in that there has been uh, a, both, in the, both amongst 
advocates, reform advocates, and then scientists have kind of come together to say, kids are literally different. <laughs> you know, I mean, we need to fix the whole system, we need to think about the whole system differently, but to the degree that we have this system that's based on punishment, the science tells us that the teenage brain is not developed. It, it, it particularly struggles with impulse control. Mm -hmm. So to the degree that we want to maintain any notion of culpability in our system, that we want to say that you are being punished for something that you were culpable for doing, then these extreme punishments for teenagers who don't have fully adult brains don't make sense. Because I was 16 years old, this happened, you know, at this point, like 20 years ago, and I have literally never forgotten what the judge said to me that day. He um, said, I am under no illusion that sending you to prison will help. And then he sentenced me to nine years in prison. One of the many ways in which we ballooned up this world of punishment, starting with Willie Boskett and running through Super Predators, was to create all these mandatory uh, sentences for certain categories of crimes. And the number of the, those categories of crimes have widened, widened, and widened, um, where, okay, you commit this crime, that means you're treated as an adult, that means you're, you're sentenced, you have a mandatory life sentence. Um, so through a series of Supreme Court cases, we have, advocates have managed to win and walk back some of those things. I want to talk about one in particular because I thought it was so interesting. I just, it was, it was the, the argument that this lawyer had in this case. So there was Atkins versus Virginia. Those mentally retarded persons who meet the law's requirements. Which basically determined that people with intellectual disabilities can't be held culpable because their minds are like children. And we jumped on that word, children. Um, and said, wait a minute, if, if, if the mentally retarded are children, then clearly children are children and they should not be executed either. If we're saying that kids aren't culpable um, because their, their minds are different, then they're just not. You know, so, so that it doesn't matter what the crime is. The culpability, we have to say that they're not as culpable. They had, there, was, there were impulse control issues and so we need a different solution. and so do our brains. So question, after viewing the video, um, do you think the juvenile justice system is operating the way it should or should it be changed? One of the names mentioned in um, the video was Willie Boskett and uh, I, uh, invite you to Google Willie Boskett, uh, last name is spelled B-O-S-K-E-T, and it gives a whole history of uh, this young man who was sexually uh, abused as a young man before he was, a young child before he was even 10 years old, a whole host of other uh, traumas in his life. He committed a murder, uh, actually several murders, was sentenced to five years in uh, juvenile uh, confinement, and there was a huge outcry in the community, which brought about in New York, a change of law where uh, juveniles could be tried as adults, even as young as 13 years old. But given what you saw in the video, uh, is this appropriate? Is this okay? And yet many states, including my own, uh, provide for uh, prosecuting youth as adults and facing those consequences. As already noted uh, in the chat and stated otherwise, uh, there are resources in available to you. I encourage you to read the resolution regarding judicial training on adolescent brain development. The National Council, of course, is uh, very focused on training judicial officers and recognizing the difference between children and adults, and also understanding and applying the principles of adolescent development, not just in delinquency proceedings, but also neglect and, and abuse or dependency proceedings. Um, Sherry's gonna talk to you about some other things now and uh, I'll turn this over to her. Thank you, Judge Romero. Good morning, everyone. I wanna talk to you for a minute 
oh, there we go, there's the first slide, um, about this publication, and that is the cover that you are looking at on the screen right now, the cover of the publication called the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines, and it is published by my, my organization, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and there is a link on the screen to that publication, and Jason just also put the link in the chat. Feel free to look at that while we're um, talking about the publication, and this was originally a publication that Council um, um, published in 2005, but the name was slightly different. It was called the Juvenile Delinquency Guidelines. And it was a very seminal and foundational publica publication for juvenile and family courts. And at that time, no other publication like it existed in the US. And it was really a guide for juvenile court judges and courts and those that work in the courts on how to process juvenile cases. And it was really looking at best practices in courts and then also considering what could be effective practices based on input and advice from a number of uh, researchers and judges and experts um, in the field of juvenile justice. And they all met for a couple of years and contributed to this initial publication. The first publication in 2005 was very much focused on case processing because it was the first publication of its kind that made a lot of sense at that time that it was very focused on the stages of the court process and what should be done in legal rights and legal processes. Um, when the publication hit its 10 year mark in 2015, uh, the team at the National Council thought, you know, a lot has happened in juvenile justice since 2005. It's a very different world that we're looking at in 2015. And we really thought that the publication needed an update. And so we spent a couple of years and we updated it and published this enhanced version in 2019. And we changed several things about the publication, the title, um, and we changed it from juvenile delinquency guidelines to juvenile justice because the term delinquency has really fallen out of favor in just those 10 years. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the publication and the guiding principles. But first, some of the other elements of the publication that we thought were really important to change, besides the title, um, is we really focused more on new information and research and evidence that had come out in the field of juvenile justice, primarily around what we learned about adolescent development, the video you just saw, which really talks about adolescent brain science and how it relates to juvenile who are in conflict with the law. Several really key and important Supreme Court rulings had come out since 2005, and Judge Romero is going to cover a few of those later in this presentation. And then uh, one of the key elements that changed in the field is we started talking about trauma and childhood trauma. And the National Council worked quite a bit with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Uh, we still partner with them today on different publications and webinars and conference sessions. And we really learned a lot and started to coin the term trauma-informed justice. And what does that mean in the juvenile court? And judges um, becoming very knowledgeable and educated about childhood trauma and how it relates to their behaviors where they're in conflict with the law. Uh, one of the things to note about the guidelines and why it's so important for us to disseminate that link is the original version in 2005 was a printed publication, and it's a very, very thick publication with lots of tabs so you can flip through it. But in 2015, when we were reevaluating, um, updating the publication, we decided that we were not going to print the new version. So the latest version is an electronic document only. And that was very intentional so that we could continue to update it. We would not have to wait every 10 years and do a reprinting. We would be able to update it as trends and information and research and Supreme Court cases are decided with really key information. And so on the National Council website, we have a, a web page dedicated just to this publication, and uh, we also save a lot of videos and webinars about the publication and other pieces of information and links to the research. When you look at the publication online, when you look at the citations, there are a lot of live links, so you can go directly out of the publication to those research um, and reports that are cited there. <clears throat> 
So instead of reading the entire publication, we're gonna boil down the essence of the publication into what we call the guiding principles. And there are, I think, 17 of them in the publication. And they really fall under two general categories. The first category is fairness, equity, and procedural justice. And the second category is pursuit of excellence. In the fairness, equity, and procedural justice category of principles, um, address the treatment of youth, families, and victims in the system. And the next category, pursuit of excellence, addresses principles that are related to improvement of the juvenile justice system itself. So let me walk you through some of the guiding principles um, that are very aspirational for our courts to achieve. We do not expect and do not see courts across the United States that have met all of the 17 guiding principles till their, to their fullest extent. That's why we call them aspirational. This gives um, courts and justice systems a goal. And if they wanna do strategic planning and work on reform and changing their systems, these guiding principles can help do that. So let's talk about the principles, and the first one being that all members of the juvenile justice court shall treat youth, families, crime victims, witnesses, and others in the system with respect, dignity, courtesy, and cultural understanding. And what this means is it's very important to sort of individualize cases and to really look at the people, the youth and the families that are in the courtroom and see them as people and see them as those that come in with traumas and stressors in their lives and different considerations and situations that should be recognized by the court as to reasons of how they came before the court. And we really talk about doing things like instead of talking to parents and calling them mom or dad, actually learning their names and calling them Mr. or Ms. So-and-so, talking to the youth, directly to the youth, talking directly to the parents, engaging them in conversations, requesting their input. Um, a lot of judges, even sometimes in youth courts, will step off the bench and sit face to face with youth in certain situations, especially if it's a specialty case where there might be mental health issues or there might be, for example, child trafficking issues, they might take a different approach um, from sitting on the bench. And it's also important to address cultural understanding and making sure that if language are, is a barrier, making sure that we're using interpreters for not just the youth, but for the family members and parents at all stages of the court process. The next guiding principle is that Juvenile court judges should ensure their systems divert cases to alternative systems whenever possible and appropriate. And you'll understand a little bit more about that as we talk about what it means to detain a youth and what those facilities are like in the United States. And that will highlight why it's so important to divert to alternative systems. But if we're talking about the purpose of the court is to restore a juvenile, to restore their competency, to rehabilitate and return them to the community, then it's really important that those services take place in the community where they live. Those types of services are not often present in facilities, and that's why it's important that we make sure that they are available within their own communities. We also find that youth who are not diverted, there's a great uh, rate of disproportionality and there's disparate treatment in their outcomes in those systems where youth are detained. All members of the juvenile justice court shall work to promote equity and impartiality when working with youth of color. Again, we're talking about great rates of disproportionality for youth of color that are in the system and disparate treatment, even when the offenses are the same as, as white or Caucasian youth. We look at um, similar offenses that are committed, similar circumstances, but the responses from the system and from the court are not equal. And that is something that when we talk about juvenile justice system reform that is being addressed and being considered a priority. Juvenile justice court judges should ensure court dispositions are both individualized and include graduated responses, both sanctions and incentives. So instead of taking that cookie cutter approach, we're really, again, trying to engage youth and their families, really learn about their circumstances to make sure that responses to the youth behavior are specific and individualized to that youth. 
And when we talk about dispositions, terminology in the juvenile court is also different from adult court. So youth are not found guilty in a youth in a juvenile court. They are adjudicated for their offenses um, and they're not sentenced. They actually have a disposition. And so just to make sure that we're clear on terminology, I just wanted to explain that. And we really talk about consequences and responses to the behavior in the disposition rather than the punishments um, that was referenced um, historically in the juvenile court. Youth charged in the formal juvenile justice court must have qualified and adequately compensated, compensated legal representation. There's a very famous well-known Supreme Court case in Regalt. That's the link to the case if you would like to learn more about it. But it basically examined um, youth who are in the justice system and said that they have the same rights as adults. They have constitutional rights to be represented by adequate counsel in their cases. They have constitutional rights to examine witnesses, to be read their Miranda rights. Um, you can read the full court case there, but we work really closely at the National Council with another organization called the National Juvenile Defender Center. And we really work together closely to make sure that juvenile courts and the systems are adequately um, educated and knowledgeable about what it means to have adequate legal representation in the juvenile court. Too often in public defender systems across the U.S., you see that as um, a learning ground for brand new attorneys who are out of law school. And it should not be a stepping stone uh, representing youth in juvenile court to other positions in the public defender or in the justice system. Rather, it's not a training ground. It should be for those who have a specific expertise, knowledge, and desire to work in the juvenile justice system. The juvenile justice court should understand adolescent development and hold youth accountable in developmentally appropriate ways. You saw that in the video um, quite a bit, and I'll just use two examples that are really common out there. Um, a lot of people are aware of, aware of some programs called scared straight programs. And the most common is uh, that you see, and there was even a television show, I think on the A&E channel that was really popular for a while, taking youth who get in trouble with the law and taking them into a jail or to a prison and meeting with the adults that are detained. And they really sort of present a very harsh reality and maybe yell at the kids. And in order to scare them straight into not becoming back into involvement with the court and leading a productive lifestyle. Um, but the research has shown and evidence has shown that that is actually not effective programming with juveniles based on adolescent development and brain development. It can be effective for maybe two to three months after they go through a scared straight program, but any long-term effects past the three to six month mark are not realized by scared straight programs. And so really there's been a movement in the juvenile justice system to talk about restorative justice. And if you work in the field, you hear that quite a bit. We talk about restorative justice, which is really uh, making sure that the youth is held accountable for their actions. There might be apologies and amends with any victims of of their offenses and consequences that are appropriate to the offense are really determined in more of um, a group-like setting. And so there's different movements away from scared straight programs and we really want courts and justice systems to make sure that when they're developing responses that they are looking at the research and, make, and the data and making sure that they're evidence-based. Juvenile justice courts should render timely and just decisions and trials should conclude without continuances. So we're really talking about the timeliness of the process of the juvenile court and how quickly or slowly cases for juveniles move through the system. Why do you think, and you can put your answers in the chat, why do you think juvenile justice courts, um, this would be important for them to really consider timeliness for juveniles? based on what you've heard so far in this presentation. I think in the, the video that everyone watched, um, 
they talked about how different youth are um, in just one or two years, they become a completely different person. And so take a minute to think about the person you are when you were 16 versus the person you were when you were just graduated high school or even 19. Were you the same? Was your maturity level the same? Uh, most likely it was not. And so, because as it was said in the chat, their brains are developing and ever changing. Um, an offense that's committed in January of a calendar year, but the court is slow and is not able to respond to the juvenile until August. By the time you get to August, that is so far away in the juvenile's mind. That is long ago history. And they would tell you that in eight months, they are not the same person. And so any sort of consequences that are enacted for that behavior that occurred in January are just not very effective according to the research. They do not carry the same impact it's almost feels like you're being um, punished for something that you feel like you didn't do because it happened so long ago, all based on that adolescent brain science. Uh, the guidelines also talk about um, juvenile justice system staff should engage parents and families at all stages of the court process and encourage family members to participate fully in the youth intervention plan. And for many of you, especially um, participating in this webinar, we talk about an intervention plan. It's really very similar to a case plan. It's basically if a youth is adjudicated, what sort of requirements are they going to need to complete in order to end their involvement with the juvenile court. So a case plan can involve um, reparations to victims, to communities, doing community service, uh, financial restitution. It can also involve what services the youth might need, if they need mental health treatment, substance youth treatment, um, if they need to improve their education and their school involvement. So all of those will be detailed in the intervention plan, and it's very important for the youth and the family and the parents to participate in that plan to make sure that that it is meaningful and specific to that youth and their development. The juvenile justice court and judges should ensure crime victims have access to all phases of the juvenile court process and receive all the services to which they are entitled by law. Unfortunately, when you visit juvenile courts across the US and if you talk to uh, folks who are involved in the court who are victims of juvenile crimes, if they become involved in the court process, they almost feel very secondary to that process. In adult courts, victims often feel like they have very specific rights and they're acknowledged by the court and they're assigned a victim advocate who helps them navigate that process. In the juvenile court, because juveniles have rights and there's so much focus on their, the restoration of the juvenile, unlike in the adult court system, it often feels to victims of juvenile crime that their rights are secondary secondary and their, their place in the process is secondary. And we don't want that to happen. So we really want to work with juvenile courts to make sure that they're observing the rights of victims of crime because they have rights in the juvenile court just like they do in the adult system. We want to make sure that victim advocates are available to navigate the juvenile justice system for those victims and make sure they're present in court. And unfortunately, we don't see that available in all courts or only if someone is really persistent in um, finding out what their rights are and receiving the services that they are entitled to. And I'm gonna turn it over to Judge Romero to talk about the second group of those guiding principles. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, as Sherry noted earlier, the uh, guiding principles include some that are entitled pursuit of excellence. And uh, she mentioned that these are directed, uh, again, aspirationally to the improvement of the juvenile justice system. And much of this falls on the judicial leadership of juvenile court judges. Um, Juvenile court judges, as do all judges, have the power of convening stakeholders. And it doesn't mean that judges uh, are the ones who have to do all the work. They can certainly call the meeting and folks will generally come, sometimes begrudgingly, but they will come anyway because the judge called the meeting. So judicial leadership is important, also fostering an attitude and climate of collaboration, not that the judge knows the whole thing, uh, but um, 
the uh, that together uh, we can come up with with uh, a community based or a collaborative uh, approach to addressing uh, some of the things that need to be changed in uh, your community and your court. Uh, and, and as Sherry just mentioned about victims of crime, victims of children's uh, uh, delinquent acts, uh, sometimes that that is a, a place to have uh, victims of crime involved too at those meetings so we can hear from them and ensure that, that they're not being overlooked in the process, that they are also being treated with dignity and respect, just like everyone else in the system. Ch Cherry mentioned uh, the, the need to have qualified um, and, and trained uh, defense attorneys. Juvenile court systems must also have uh, not just trained and, and qualified and dedicated judges, but uh, staff, facilities, and program resources. In too many jurisdictions, in, in the past at least, and I believe it's changing now, certainly in, in my community, uh, juvenile court judges were sent to juvenile court because that was a training ground. That's where they, were, where they learned to be real judges in kitty court, and then they moved on up to criminal court, to uh, divorce court, or to the civil division. Uh, the, the point should be that judges in juvenile court ought to be judges who have training and experience and want to be there and are committed to being there and also exercising that leadership uh, requirement of improving and applying these uh, guiding principles. One of the things that happens uh, with kids is they end up in two systems, duly adjudicated or crossover kids. I think sometimes the term is used, I even dual jacketed kids in some jurisdictions, but these are kids who uh, are wards of the state in neglect and abuse systems, but also are alleged to have committed uh, offenses that would end up in the juvenile justice system. It's important that the left hand know what the right hand is doing. So one, uh, one judge should be handling both cases. And again, that's still a work in progress, but it is a principle that is intended to improve the whole system, juvenile justice, juvenile court, and of course, dependency court as well. So that one judge handles both cases from beginning to a logical conclusion. In some jurisdictions, once disposition occurs, and especially if a commitment is uh, to a long-term facility, what uh, sometimes is referred to as a, a juvenile prison, uh, one or two year or commitment until the age of 21 or older, um, judges in the juvenile court lose jurisdiction. That doesn't mean you can't keep um, uh, in touch with what's going on with that youth that you sent to that facility for rehabilitation and training. As long as that uh, child, that youth is involved in the juvenile justice system, uh, judges should take an active role in ensuring that uh, once they're ready to be released, that the services that they were entitled to are provided for, not just at the end, but during their time in uh, the uh, confinement, the commitment that they uh, were uh, sentenced to, for lack of a better term. One of the words that's tossed around a lot is that of holding kids accountable. I, I am a firm believer that we, uh, the adults, the highly trained, highly paid professionals should be accountable as well. I actually prefer the term joint responsibility as opposed to accountable because youth have a responsibility as do their families and everyone who touches their lives to improve their, their situation. They are citizens of our community. They are future taxpayers and we want them to be successful. So the juvenile court judges uh, are, you know, we have a responsibility to hold our systems accountable and also collaborate with our prosecuting attorneys uh, in my system called children's court attorneys uh, and the juvenile public defenders and others, the service providers, uh, juvenile probation and so forth to ensure that we're all working positively toward an outcome that will uh, result in uh, a better 
trained, better equipped young person and their family to enter back into the community or continue in the community. Hopefully they weren't removed from the community. Data are very important. Uh, our court systems must uh, have uh, court management systems that provide that data so we know whether what we're doing is working or not working or whether there, where there are gaps and we need to uh, improve on those areas. Um, we need to uh, have policies that allow us to serve certain information with other agencies, uh, with the child welfare agency, with the uh, children's court attorneys, with juvenile probation, if they're not part of the court system. Uh, not all juvenile probation systems are part of the court. They're part of a separate entity like they are in New Mexico. Training is very important. Uh, and again, I, you know, as uh, speaking on behalf of the National Council and someone who's been involved with the council from the time I became a judge, uh, the council is in the business of training juvenile court judges. This whole uh, uh, guiding principles is part of that training. And, and we should ensure that not only court staff, but other system participants are also involved in training. Sherry mentioned you know, uh, child sex trafficking earlier. That's an area that if only the judge has received training on what the trauma symptoms are and, and, and how to identify uh, those who have been trafficked, but the rest of the court system does not, uh, they're gonna be treated perhaps not like they should be treated uh, based on tr the trauma they've experienced, the trauma they continue to experience and what, they're ex what is likely to happen uh, because of their bond to the person who's been trafficking them. So training is not just the responsibility of the administrative office of the courts, in each individual court system, the juvenile court judges should ensure that that training is uh, offered and participated in. So we've talked a lot about the guiding principles and if you'd like to note in the chat box, which of these kind of rang true with you the most, uh, one or two of them, but which of the guiding principles do you feel are very critical, uh, especially to you, if you wanna put that in the chat box. Excellent, trauma responsive training. I like the term trauma responsive, even though trauma informed is kind of a foundational beginning, but uh, to be trauma informed by itself and not be trauma responsive, you're only halfway there, if at all. Other thoughts about which guiding principles are most critical to you? I uh, learned from a, a, a very uh, seasoned judge who basically said, you know, a day uh, for uh, an adult uh, happens in, and comes very quickly, especially the older you get, time flies. For kids, it's a little different. A day is like a month or a year. It's important that the timely uh, handling of the cases is, uh, is something that we not lose sight of if we want uh, whatever services are offered, whatever disposition is, is ordered, that it has meaning for the young person and is closely related to the uh, event that they are being adjudicated for or were adjudicated for, or that they're on probation for or have a case plan that they're working on. Like Jane's uh, comment, uh, and, and it's very affirming, all of the principles, all of the guiding principles are very important. Uh, and while they're aspirational, uh, it's uh, important to, to implement them. Uh, and even if you're not judges um, or otherwise, you know, an attorney, it's, you, you have a voice, you can have, have it heard in whatever system you're in. Uh, 
to ensure that these principles are uh, advocated for and, and, and implemented. Thank you all for your responses. Uh, and, and I like that one family, one judge uh, uh, response as well. The uh, resources that are listed on this slide are available for your review. Uh, the use of fines and fees for youth really have to do with, you know, criminalizing poverty. Uh, fines and fees, uh, generally youth are not able to pay for them. Their parents are, and very often their parents are not able to pay them either. And it just adds up and adds up. And pretty soon uh, justice is delayed because something didn't get paid for and we're criminalizing poverty. The shackling of youth, the... Uh, uh, that resource basically talks a lot about youth development and about trauma and what shackling uh, can do to kids and, and ad, uh, affect them adversely. A reminder that judges have the ability and the responsibility, as I mentioned earlier, to direct what happens in their courtroom. Um, if you don't want kids brought into your courtroom in leg irons and handcuffs, uh, you need to, you know, judges need to take the lead and exercise that leadership to say that's not happening in my court, you bring a youth in unshackled. Um, New Mexico has a Supreme Court rule that basically sets out that they shouldn't be shackled in the courtroom. And if they're going to be because of safety concerns, that has to be heard uh, by the judge and ruled on before the case comes up. Racial and ethnic disparities are very real. Uh, that publication talks about how uh, judges and other court involved individuals should address bias and delinquency in the child welfare systems, uh, checking ourselves and uh, looking for our own implicit biases before we take the bench. And not just judges, but others who participate in the court system. We all have our implicit biases and we need to check them at the door and ensure that we're uh, dealing with these kids in a fair and impartial way. <clears throat> LGBTQ issues are, are very front and center, and, and, and uh, it's important that um, LGBTQ individuals not be treated uh, with less respect, with less dignity than anyone else um, in, that appears before the judge or is involved in the, court, in the juvenile court system. Uh, they have names, uh, they may, uh, they have you know, families, they have their own experiences, and when a transgender youth um, identifies by a particular gender and have a name that's consistent with that gender, it's important that the court uh, officer, the judge, the special master, and anyone else dealing with that child respect that choice that they are making and not uh, otherwise uh, demean them or, or show any less respect. There was mention earlier of uh, three Supreme Court rulings, and I'll very you know there uh, you can look those up uh, based on you know just uh, Google the, the the names. But very simply, it it, it relied on the uh, research and the studies done on adolescent development. And Roper versus Simmons involved uh, a young man who committed murder, was uh, sentenced to life without parole. It was appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that based on the arguments and the facts and, and testimony from the um, American Psychological Association, I believe, uh, I think that was the one uh, where they provided their amicus brief, uh, that uh, that amounted to cruel and unusual punishment under the uh, Eighth Amendment to the Constitution and the court found accordingly, basically, saying what we heard in the video, uh, they're not, they're still kids. They're not, you know, to, to sentence them to life in prison without the possibility of parole is not appropriate given what we know about brain development, adolescent development. That was in 2005. Five years later in Graham versus Florida, uh, the, uh, that, that youth was, was basically, uh, I'm sorry, Roper versus Simmons involved the execution of a child. And, and they basically said that ex execution was not appropriate given the brain development and adolescent development science that we knew. 
in Graham versus Florida, that was life without parole. In, um, and the case did not involve the taking of a life. The Supreme Court ruled that in non-homicide cases, life without parole was inappropriate, leaving the door open for, well, if the kid commits murder in their sentence, uh, life without parole may be appropriate. Uh, two years later in Miller versus Alabama, the Supreme Court continued the, the trend and uh, wisely so of saying um, that for any offense, whether it's a homicide offense or not, life without parole is inappropriate. Again, given what science and adolescent brain development and youth development uh, was teaching us uh, in the juvenile court process. Let's talk about confinement, kind of a, a friendly term to say lockup or jail. Uh, but on any given day in 2018, you can see at the slide the many youth in the United States who were confined away from their home, away from their families, away from their pets, away from everything they knew as, as, uh, as standard fare in their lives. And they were confined because of their involvement in the juvenile justice system and sometimes because they had been tried as adults in the criminal justice system. These facilities were not home-like facilities, but they were restrictive. They very much looked like jails or prisons and many of them were held in what in the adult system may be called um, pretrial detention uh, and in uh, the juvenile justice system pre-adjudication uh, for their own good, for the, for the good of the community without really thinking about what offense they were alleged to have committed. Happily, since 2000, this trend of, of uh, decreasing numbers of youth in confinement is a good trend in the minds of many. Um, and given what we know about brain science, about youth development, uh, that's a, a good sign, but more, you know, that, that number since 2000, uh, the number of folks in confinement has fallen by more than 65%. Here's another graphic, uh, another graph uh, that shows much of the uh, same information about uh, youth detained or committed in juvenile residential placement facilities and the decline that that has shown uh, from uh, 2000 and 2018. Uh, the uh, site located at the bottom, uh, the uh, uh, information that you can get there about this and other factors is very important. I would invite you to take a look, not just at that uh, uh, site, but the, uh, and the, the information that's presented on this slide, but much more information that is available. Sherry's going to talk to us some more about facilities now. Thank you, Judge Romero. So you have three pictures on your screen of juvenile residential placement facilities. And we're just trying to use some visual aids to show the differences in what facilities look like. And I think that many people assume or expect or at least hope that this is what facilities look like for juveniles who are being um, confined in the US. And, we, and there are these facilities and there's some really nice that maybe even look like homes or college campuses with nice green lawns and outdoor activities, um, but they're not as common. Um, and even in these types of facilities, abuses can happen and traumas can occur. There was um, a private facility, privately funded facility in Pennsylvania that was shut down and their campuses looked like college campuses, but even abuses occurred in those places and they were shut down the last few years. This is the other pictures. This is what prison like settings. And unfortunately we didn't have the pictures of what they look like from the outside, but they look, you can't tell that they're a youth facility. If you were to drive by them, you would think they look like a prison or a jail for adults because from the outside and even from the inside, if you don't see who's being detained, they look almost exactly the same. They have bars, 
uh, youth are wearing uniforms, there are shackling, restraints that are often used. The outside has razor wire, high fencing, they might have observation towers, and they certainly have staff that are armed and um, use force to control those facilities. There's a high level of security in the facilities and youth um, are often escorted place to place, whether it be to meals or to showers. Um, they're escorted just like in that picture. Um, oftentimes, if they're escorted down the hall in a, um, a non-facility uh, person is walking through, they have to stop, face the wall, turn away until they walk by just to make sure there's absolutely no contact. Oh, let me go back to that picture for one second. Uh, the National Council is part of a program at the U.S. State Department where uh, the State Department brings in um, international visitors from other countries who are seeking to learn more about our justice system. The U.S. system is a Western system of justice and it's considered a model and a standard throughout the world. So oftentimes we will host members of the judiciary, um, attorneys, uh, victim and violence advocates and social workers from other countries to come learn about how we are operating juvenile justice in the United States. And oftentimes by they, they're usually here for several weeks to a month or longer. And by the time they make it to the National Council offices in Reno, they have made a lot of stops along the way. And they have actually visited several of these juvenile detention or residential facilities. And and oftentimes when we see them, the questions that they ask are very much focused around our facilities because they're shocked. We're supposed to be a model, but in their country, they would never ever consider having facilities like this exist. And they don't understand how we're so progressive as a country and how we look at adolescent development and being trauma responsive, yet we still operate so many of these prison-like residential facilities. And there's really not a good answer to why these facilities are in such abundance and exist across the U.S., except to say, as long as the citizens and the public are willing to tolerate them and to tolerate having juveniles held in these types of facilities. Some facts to keep in mind. We talk about predisposition. So this is the point in the juvenile court process before the youth is adjudicated and it's determined whether or not they committed the offenses that they are charged with or not. In 51% of the cases for youth predisposition, the youth was detained even though they were not yet adjudicated delinquent. So that's slightly more than half of those cases they were detained before we even found out or determined if they were adjudicated. In 19% of the cases in which the youth was detained, they were adjudicated and placed out of the home, 42% were put on probation and 26% were dismissed. So of the youth detained, only 19% of them actually were adjudicated. So we're looking at real disparities and how we look at this system, pre-adjudication and predisposition and treatment of youth. In fewer than four in 10 cases in which the youth was detained, the youth's most serious offense was a person offense and 27% of those were dismissed. So we're really talking about looking at facilities and detaining youth should only really be for security and safety reasons. Safety for the public and the community um, for the most serious and violent offenders and acts. And yet we are seeing by the data that that is not the case, that we're holding a lot of kids who are not serious and violent offenders and for much longer periods of time than seem necessary. When we look at the data post disposition, so this is after they've been adjudicated and a disposition is being determined for the youth, most of the youth, about 63%, do not ever return to the juvenile court after their first referral. And so a lot of experts will use this stat to really say that the juvenile justice system should consider a light touch with juveniles. Just because adolescents are experimenting, they're, um, they're not always using the, the right rationale for their behaviors, that oftentimes they don't need a response. They're just not going to commit that act again as they mature and grow in age.
More than six in 10 youth did not have a serious offense in the course of their juvenile court career. So most of these are kids with less severe infractions. And then only a small proportion of youth in one study, which was 14%, generated a large proportion of the cases. And we've even seen that in early 2000, we were looking at that was called the 7% solution. Now we talk about it being about 14% of the youth who come involved in the justice system are really the ones that are your repeat offenders, your serious violent offenders, who seem to be making sort of what they call a career out of offending. And that's a really small percentage of the juvenile justice population. And what's important to know is that's where the resources in the system and the money need to be concentrated, not to the low level and mid level offenders who come through the system one time. These are the kids that do not need the light touch. They need more intervention, they need more service services, they need that, the trauma responses that Judge Romero was talking about. And that's also important why so many of you that are participating in the webinar, that is where your services come into play, is we really need to concentrate on the small co cohort of youth. Some other stats to keep in mind, 80% of the girls who are detained report having experienced physical abuse in their lifetime and 50% report sexual abuse. Those are really, really high numbers and really show that trauma experienced by the youth just must have to play into how they became involved in the justice system. 60% of youth in detention do not return to school or drop out within five months of being detained. And that's a really large number. And that really goes to show there's something really harmful that might be happening in detention. Uh, some, there was a lot of talk in the chat about shame and how the system really should not continue to contribute to any process which might shame the juvenile. And I think that you can see from this stat, there really is something happening by just the involvement or the labeling or the treatment that they're receiving in the system or in detention. One in three youth develop depression after being detained. Could you imagine looking at the photos if you were detained? I'd probably come out depressed as well um, and be a different person when I came out of a facility. Roughly a quarter of children detained are acutely mentally ill. Um, and again, that goes to show the need for services and treatment rather than punishments. 7% of adjudicated youth in juvenile facilities reported sexual victimization in their current facility. And we talk about that sexual vi victimization and you think 7% sounds low, but shouldn't it be 0%? Even 1% is too much. And that's victimization by other youth in the facilities. And you can see we have these prison-like settings and there's so much security, but yet somehow the victimization still occurs. But it's also that 7% is victimization by the staff that work in those facilities. And that's unacceptable and that's what has to change. And um, one of the federal laws that we didn't uh, really address is PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And it does have components that are very much um, directed to juvenile facilities. So if you want to look up PREA, P-R-E-A, you can little, learn a little bit more about the federal requirements uh, for prevention in facilities. 51% of youth reported prior sexual victimization from prior facilities. So maybe not, there was only 7% were victimized in the current facility, but 51% said, yeah, sometime in my lifetime, I've experienced victimization in a prior placement or facility. Minority youth are detained at a rate one and a half times the rate for white youth and placed at a rate 1.4 times the rate for white youth. And again, this is looking at similar circumstances and offenses and that there's this disproportionality that's happening with youth of color. And I think that just goes to show why detention is so harmful and why we really need to reform and change the way we look at the juvenile justice system and how we hold youth accountable. And now we have a poll question that's being launched. And the question is, should youth who are committing a status offense be detained? You can only choose one answer and the responses are yes, they should be detained. No, they should not. 
or I don't know. And I don't know is a very appropriate answer. And if you're not sure what a status offense is, you can take a guess and we'll talk about that in a second. And if you um, are not able to respond to the poll, you're welcome to put a response in chat. So should youth committing a status offense be detained? Yes, no, or I don't know. Okay, I think we can probably share the responses. So 5% said yes, which was only about two folks, so very low. 21 uh, folks or 53% said no. And 17 folks, which are 43% of our audience said, I don't know. And not really surprised because uh, many of you are not regularly involved in the justice system. And we don't really expect that you maybe are quite aware of what status offenders are in their unique placement and role in the just, juvenile justice system. So let's talk about status offenders for a minute. A status offense is a non-criminal act that is considered a law violation only because of the youth status as a minor. So only because of their age and being a youth or an adolescent, is it a criminal act? Typical status offenses uh, include truancy, running away from home, violating curfew, the underage use of alcohol, and then sometimes just what they call general ungovernability. And so these are all acts as adults that are not illegal, but if you were a youth, they were. And so they have a separate place in the justice system and they're called status offenses. According to federal guidance, the purpose of juvenile detention is to confine only those who are serious, violent, or chronic offenders pending legal action. So again, we're only looking at that really small percentage of the population, 14% or less, that should be detained. Based on these criteria, it's not considered appropriate for status offenders, your runaways, your truants, curfew violators, underage drinking, and youth that commit technical violations of probation to be detained. Those are not serious, violent offenses. And even if those offenses are chronic, they don't rate the level of being detained. And we'll talk about um, technical violations of probation. So when youth are on probation, they're also often given a list, and sometimes it can be a very long list of requirements for curfew, for school attendance, for how they respond to their parents, how often they check into probation, drug testing, uh, restitution, community service, a whole list of what's considered rules they have to abide by. And if they do not follow all of these, and I would even challenge most adults would have um, some challenges making sure that they adhere to all of the conditions of probation for juveniles, um, a juvenile probation officer can file a complaint in court that they are in violation of the order. And that can escalate the case and they can detain them for that reason. And there has been a movement the last 10 years in this country to make sure that for probation term violations, youth are not to be detained. If they commit a new offense, then that new offense is examined as to whether it meets the need as a serious violent crime to be detained in a facility. Otherwise, status offenders um, for violation probations can really escalate and pe penetrate deeper into juvenile justice system that is really necessary and it's really unfortunate. So despite the federal guidance that says this is not to be done, there's still almost 4,000 youth that are held in detention centers for these low level offenses. And nearly 2,000 more youth have been sentenced to serve time there for other offenses. And I will tell you that the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention has a, um, a great website where they talk about the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, which has been around for quite a while and was most recently reauthorized in 2018. And that act provides guidance to states about the care and custody of youth in the justice system. 
And some of the main points of the act are talking about the deinstitutionalization of status offenders, which is where some of this very specific guidance comes from in the act. It also addresses adult jail and lockup removal. Youth should never be uh, placed in ability and locked up with adults. And even if the facilities um, share a location, there has to be sight and sound separation between juveniles, adults, and the facility. There should be absolutely no contact between adults and juveniles who are detained. And then the act also addresses racial and ethnic disparities and some requirements for states. And there's funding that many states, I think 49 out of 50, receive from the federal government to address juvenile justice in their states. And a lot of that funding is tied around to their compliance and reporting compliance with the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. I'll turn this back over to Judge Romero. Thank you, Sherry. <clears throat> As you're looking at the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act, those who are curious in its provisions, I urge you to look at the valid court order exception and, and, and how that contributes to status offenders being locked up when they shouldn't be. Uh, but let's focus on the graph uh, on, on the uh, graphics before us. And, and detention is um, used too often by judges. And, and the cop out is give me some other options unless you can uh, provide some options where I can not lock the kid up and, and keep the community safe and keep the kids safe. Uh, my only option is to lock them up. <clears throat> that, that's a cop-out. That's not providing judicial leadership. That's you know going with the flow, doing the same old thing the same old way and expecting a different result. Uh, some of the data show that at least um, uh, the, the judges uh, with cases before them the default position in 25% of the cases is to detain. And remember this detention very often happens uh, while they're awaiting the next hearing, a hearing that will maybe set the trial date if there's going to be one, the, the adjudication date. Uh, and if they've been adjudicated, they haven't even been disposed of yet. A sentence or disposition has not been arrived at or a decision on where they're gonna be placed. So again, status offenders, technical violations, uh, there are way too many youth who fit that category who are detained. <clears throat> and then the other uh, slide talks to us a little bit about um, minor offenses that uh, uh, judges cop out and, and lock these kids up or hold them until another option comes up. Uh, rather than advocating for, uh, you know, exercising judicial leadership and in the community advocating for other options rather than saying, give me some options. If they're not there, help create some other options so that we're not detaining kids unnecessarily and uh, harming them more than they already are. After adjudication and disposition, uh, the most common placement uh, for youth is to commitment, commit them to the custody of the state usually or to a residential treatment facility. And these facilities are long-term secure facilities where as Sherry kind of pointed out earlier, very much like prisons. Uh, the, uh, they can be called any number of things, reformatory, training schools, uh, treatment centers, uh, but they're not all cut from the same cloth. Uh, they're, sadly, many of these facilities will take kids and judge will send them there because a bed is available. Not asking the question, is this uh, commitment really going, going to help change the behavior of this child if in fact they need behavior change? And uh, the, the Facilities range in size from maybe 20 beds to, you know, 200 beds, and, and they're very much like prisons with the bars and, and the orange jumpsuits that were demonstrated in, in uh, an earlier slide. Well, you would think that this is a positive thing to send kids to long-term commitments, but the, the studies show 
that they really don't help. Kids go to these facilities, and I think there was a slide earlier about, uh, or a, a comment in the chat, you know, uh, about, uh, about we, we, you know, the way we treat kids and people is the way they're going to come out. I think a, a judge in Louisiana, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, had a saying that I kind of hung on to, hurt people, hurt people. You know, if we are harming them more than we are helping them by the choices we are making, let's not be surprised when they come out and they end up recidivating, committing new offenses. And let's not uh, uh, be shocked at the cost of, of locking kids up for a year. I think some of the com some of the comparisons that be made to put a child in a long term uh, prison facility for one year, you can almost pay for a Harvard uh, education uh, with that cost. Not only uh, the the uh, the costs and and the negative results once they get released, but they're not safe in those facilities. Uh, one of the slides that Sherry pointed out earlier, sexual abuse in, in these facilities is frequent, not, not just for girls, but for boys as well. Um, there's an interesting publication that Rights for Girls researched and, and uh, developed, you know, sexual abuse to prison pipeline. And not just in juvenile justice, but in child welfare, sexual abuse of uh, any gender maybe especially LGBTQ youth who end up in the system is way more uh, pervasive than uh, we think it is. And it leads to uh, negative consequences when we uh, detain these folks in long-term commitments. So what do we do about it? Uh, well, I pointed out earlier that there's a decline, a trend that seems to be continuing and no let up in sight, a, a positive trend that says we're detaining fewer and fewer kids. Uh, but how do we make things better? Well, one of the things I already pointed out, stop locking kids up, reduce incarceration, uh, and stop looking at the juvenile justice system as being like the adult system and that kids are just little adults. Reform the punitive approach. Let's rehabilitate. Let's be positive and look at these kids as our own kids. The Annie Casey Foundation has another punchline. Use the my child standard. If this were my child, what would I want the disposition to be? How, what would I want the probation terms to be if they end up on probation? And by the way, most kids in the juvenile justice system, their disposition ends up being probation, not long-term commitment. And many of those kids that are on probation should have been diverted shouldn't even be on probation. Um, and another way to uh, improve the juvenile justice system is to stop using prison-like facilities. Uh, and instead, let's have some uh, case plans, some interventions that actually uh, are uh, <clears throat> evidence-based that show that uh, these programs will work to uh, in uh, train these kids better, to engage them in a desire to want to do better. Uh, instead of investing money in bigger and better lockups, because if you build it, you will fill it, reinvest instead in what works. And we know that locking kids up uh, using a punitive approach rather than a rehabilitative approach is not working. Let's reinvest in what works. So the next couple of slides are going to uh, suggest some things that, that do work. <clears throat> Community-based resources are shown to work much better than removing kids from their communities and placing them in many instances far away from their families. So continued connections with family members are near impossible. Uh, the Missouri model is one of the, the models that's looked to as sort of a, 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 a way to do things. Uh, 30 years ago, Missouri basically said, we're not doing prison anymore. Uh, they called them training schools. Uh, they changed the, the makeup of, of the facilities that they did have to more like college campus with dorm uh, kind of, uh, of setups in their, for their rooms. And they became treatment centers instead of training schools or long-term commitment facilities. And their focus was on rehabilitation. 
<clears throat> the Missouri model uh, was one of the leading um, examples and continues to be uh, for juvenile justice reform, making things better, things that work, investing in things that work. Well, some folks say, well, what about kids that, you know, uh, commit person offenses, uh, that is, you know, assault, rape, uh, battery, uh, murder, uh, uh, you know, weapons offenses, uh, those kids really ought to be locked up. Uh, well, that isn't necessarily true. Uh, juvenile justice experts have basically said we shouldn't reject those who are adjudicated for having committed violent offenses. Um, home and community-based uh, programs are proven to be much more effective than lockups uh, for kids charged with any kind of an offense, uh, violent or otherwise. Uh, Evidence-based programs that reduce violence and uh, delinquent criminal and aggressive behavior among youth uh, are out there. And if they're not, we need to take a leadership role in developing them. Uh, these are kinds of programs that those who develop them say, Plagiarism is great. You don't, you don't need special permission. If it works, you're free to, to implement it and use it in your community in a way that fits your community, but fits in my community may not fit in yours. Instead of spending money and building more facilities, uh, let's spend money uh, in community-based alternatives uh, rather than lock up. Tennessee and Georgia, as noted in the slide, have uh, come up with some creative ways of doing this that serve as incentive, incentives to develop incent, uh, alternatives to incarceration. Trauma in justice involved populations is very important. Um, my, my take used to be, uh, I can safely assume that 99% of the folks that walk through the front door of my courthouse and enter my courtroom have some sort of trauma in their lives. They've so many of them have experienced serious trauma. Uh, again, look at, at, at the website for, uh, that I mentioned earlier for uh, Willie Basket, and you can see the trauma that was inflicted upon him before he was even 10, even 10 years old. Uh, Trauma-informed care, not punishment, should be the standard not incarceration. Sherry's gonna to talk to us now about juvenile offenses and military jurisdiction. While I'm speaking, if you have questions for Judge Romero or I about the presentation of the juvenile court process, please feel free to start entering those in chat right now. But before we wrap up and, and look at some of the questions, I just wanted to talk really quickly about an issue that's um, very serious and is receiving a lot of attention about juvenile offenses in military jurisdiction. So military installations in the land that they reside on have two types of jurisdiction. There's either, either exclusive legislative jurisdiction where the federal government has the sole jurisdiction and the state does not have authority to legislate um, for those enclaves. And then there's concurrent legislative jurisdiction where both the state and the federal government have both full legislative jurisdiction. And the state has reserved itself the right to exercise concurrently with the US the same authority. The uh, military one source um, with the DOD has a really great document and that's the link at the bottom of this slide to take a look at that explains these two types of jurisdiction and what the issues are. So basically, um, because of the Federal Juvenile Delinquency Act that I mentioned, most offenses on exclusive jurisdiction can only be prosecuted in a federal court. The federal court is not set up for juvenile offenders and is not set up for youth. So it's not an appropriate place for youth and their offenses when they're committed on a mili military installation to be prosecuted. In the absence of those prosecutions, um, commanders at um, exclusive federal jurisdiction installations have to figure out, well, what are we going to do to handle this juvenile misconduct? And so they're left at trying to determine some um, alternatives, which could be juvenile review boards and other programs that address juvenile misconduct. But then that begs the question, are the processes and the responses they're developing adolescent informed, uh, adolescent development informed, adolescent 
adolescent brain informed? Are they trauma informed and trauma responsive? Oftentimes, a lot of these offenses are not even prosecuted um, because one, everyone knows that the, that federal system is not an appropriate place for juveniles. Even if some of the most egregious offenses, especially for children with problematic sexual behaviors, even those sexually based offenses are not prosecuted for these exclusive um, jurisdiction facilities. And that's become a real problem. And some of these cases have made some real headlines in recent years. But the DOD is really requesting that even in these exclusive jurisdiction facilities that we really start to look at ways that the U.S. Attorney's Office um, should reconsider and the installations and commanders should start working towards concurrent jurisdiction for some of these matters with their state courts. And this is just some of the reasons why um, some of these cases are not prosecuted. Um, so we're looking at um, working with um, the Department of Defense and trying to work with states to figure out how can we make sure there's a place for juveniles who commit offenses on military installations in their nearby state courts and the counties that they are near and making sure that there are some responses and access to services and treatment. And that's really the basis of our project at the National Council. Um, on military families um, who are in the court system. And when we look at juvenile court cases right now, that has really been the focus is what can we do and how can we be part of a process that's facilitating connections between installations and their local nearby state courts. Thank you so much for a lovely presentation. And we did just want to say, um, I know that we've had a couple questions um, coming in from YouTube as well as in this chat pod. Um, and we would love to refer you, if you have not already, to a few other webinars we already have under the topic of the Sexual Behavior in Children and Youth series that are relevant to today's conversation um, and some of the chat that we've been seeing coming through for today. So we definitely recommend you checking that out. And again, that is linked. Thank you so much, Jason. Just link that as well as you will find that on the event page for today's webinar. And we thank you both so much for your time today, um, Sherry and um, Honorable Judge Romero. We thank you both so much. And I think we had one quick question come in um, from Nicole about what determines whether a youth is tried as an adult or a juvenile. Let me take the first crack at that. I, I think it depends on you know, it's that dreaded lawyer answer. It depends, and it depends on what your state's legislation, uh, children's code, uh, juvenile justice code uh, states. But in some places, there are transfer hearings where uh, the uh, uh, children's court attorney, prosecuting attorney, moves to transfer the case to adult court, uh, and a judge in the in the juvenile court can decide to keep the case or to transfer it. Other places like in New Mexico, the uh, prosecutor's office may direct file under certain circumstances. In my state, if a child is charged with first degree murder, it automatically is deemed to be a serious violent offense by a juvenile, and that child is charged in adult court. Uh, there are other variations on that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it depends again on each state. Sherry, you want to add anything to that? Only that in our guidelines, the recommendation is those decisions be left to judges. They're most often left to prosecutors and others, but we really um, want the transfer decisions to be in the hands of the judge. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, and again, if you have any questions for them, um, Sherry and uh, Judge Romero's information will be um, available here in a few moments if you would like to reach out to them. And if you have any questions regarding today's um, webinar or any issues, please feel free to email our team, um, Military Families Learning Network, Family Development Team. Here in a few, we'll be posting that information for you to reach out to us. And lastly, we, uh, the National Council has this National Resource Center of Military Connected Families in the Courts, and that's the link. And um, that addresses all juvenile and family court case types. And again, thank you. We really appreciate your participation and your comments in the chat were fabulous and your questions. And we really appreciate your participation today.
Thank you all very much. Thanks, y'all, both so much for your time um, and for bringing your expertise to this topic to our audience. Um, I see we have a couple questions regarding CE credits. If you would like to to receive CE credits for today's webinar, um, please visit our event page for today's session. On that page, you will see a there will be a purple button, a continuing education button. Once you click that, it will take you to an evaluation. Um, your input is very important to us, so we do ask a few um, evaluation questions about today's session, and then you will be directed to a page with um, all of the CE credit opportunity links. From there, you will click on um, either any of the CE credits that you hope to obtain. We will offer University of Texas um, at Austin Steve Hicks School of Social Work CE credits for case managers from the Commission for Case Manager Certification and um, for certified family life educators from the National Council on Family Relations. We also, of course, will offer certificates of completion for today's session. Um, and thank you so much. If you have any questions, yes, please email us at mflnfamilydevelopment at gmail.com. And Jason, I will be sure to assist you um, in getting your certificate. Please, if you have not done that with us already, give that about 24 to 48 hours to receive the email. If you have not, please first check your spam folder. Sometimes it will kick it to your spam, especially if you have not received certificates with us before. But if you've done those things and have not received your certificate, please feel free to email us again at our Gmail and we will ensure that you receive that certification. Again, this, this today's webinar is part of our Greater Sexual Behavior in Children and Youth series. We have a host of um, different webinars under this topic area, so we invite you to check that out, as well as if you visit the series homepage, subscribing to our mailing list, especially if this topic area is one of interest to you and your work. We will continue to, into 2022, um, have programming and webinars and additional programming on this topic area, um, and we'll invite you to stay updated with us through our mailing list today. And with that, to officially wrap things up, I'm going to turn things over to Coral. Again, thank you all so much for your time today and today's session. And thank you, Sherry um, and Judge Romero for your presentation. Thanks so much, Kaylin. Another massive thank you to Judge Romero and Ms. Ely for your expertise and time today, as well as to all of you who contributed to our conversation in the chat pod. We'll stay on for just another moment or two in case you need to grab any final links. Um, one final note, we did record today's session, so you can find that as well on our event page, along with the slides, resources, continuing education information, and our contact info as well, should you need to follow up with any items from today's session. Thanks again for tuning in, and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day, rest of your week, and look forward to seeing you again soon.